I'd like to welcome you to the Serpentine Leaf Miner Information Session. This has been brought to you by New South Wales Department of Prime Industry. My name is Jonathan Eccles. I'm from Greater Sydney Local Land Services. And over the next hour, we will be presenting five speakers to you. I do request that you turn your audio off at, the mo at this time. And uh, if practical, you, you can certainly, you're welcome to keep your camera on. As I mentioned, uh, we do have uh, five presenters and if I can ask Joanne, thank you. Um, our first speaker will be Shannon Mulholland from, Shannon is, is a biosecurity epidemiologist from New South Wales DPI at Arimbo on the central coast of New South Wales. Shannon will present the New South Wales situation update as of today. Our second speaker will be Dr. Elia Pertel, who is a research scientist in entomology and sustainable agriculture from CSER in Melbourne. And Elio will be talking about the pest biology. Our third speaker will be Rowan Burgess, who is the surveillance project coordinator with Plant Health, Plant Health Australia in Canberra. And Rowan will be talking about pesticides and the chemistry involved with serpentine leaf miner. Our third speaker will be Dr. Peter Ridland, who is the Honorary Research Fellow from the University of Melbourne. He will be speaking on integrated pest management of serpentine leaf miner. And our final speaker will be Lloyd Kingham, who is, with plant, who is the Plant Biosecurity Officer at New South Wales DPI in Orange. And Lloyd will be speaking about the re regulatory requirements um, with, to do with serpentine leaf miner. Now, for those of you who have not used Zoom before, there is a chat function, which in most cases is down at the bottom of your screen. You're please welcome to um, type any of your questions in that chat function. And at the end of our presentations, we will have a Q&A panel session with all the presenters. Um, we may not be able to answer all your questions in the time allocated. However, we can certainly get back to you um, through email. The webinar will be recorded and a link will be placed on the DPI website. All, all, all registrant uh, guests will also receive the link to the recording. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Shannon Mulholland to speak about the New South Wales situation update with Serpentine Leaf Miner. Welcome, Shannon. Thanks, Jonathan. If you just give me half a second, I'm just going to share my screen with you so that we can get the presentation up. Um, this one. All right, now. Is that coming up on your screen, Jonathan? If you can just uh, select slideshow, you're yeah. just on just on Sorry, present. Um, just taking a little bit minute. My internet's a little bit slow. Hopefully, that's up on your screen now. Is that correct? It seems to be coming through. Yep, all success. Okay, Off good. you go, let's, Shannon. Let's hope the internet holds up a little bit more <laughs> during the talk. All right, thanks everyone for taking the time to join us today. I'm here to just present a very quick overview of the current situation we're facing in New South Wales. I will then hand off to the industry experts to cover a little bit more detail about the pest biology and some of the control options that we're faced with at the moment. Uh, my role here is just basically to set the scene for what we have right now, and they'll come in with a lot more of the detail behind it. So we had a call to the emergency plant pest hotline in late October from a grower in Western Sydney who was noticing some severe leaf miner damage on his vegetable crops. There were quite a few different crop types that were affected, but mainly leafy vegetables and Asian vegetables. Uh, he reported that the damage had been present for a few months, but was increasingly getting worse. And the current management options that he was trying weren't succeeding and he needed more help to work out what the problem was. 
We sent some samples through to our expert entomologist at the Orange Agricultural Institute, and their testing confirmed that it was in fact serpentine leaf miner, Lyriomyza huidobrensis, which is an exotic leaf miner. So this is the first record of this particular leaf miner in Australia. We do have some endemic species present in New South Wales, and we also have one other exotic species, the vegetable leaf miner that has been reported in far north Queensland. Uh, but this is the first report of serpentine leaf miner. <clears throat> We're not clear at this stage exactly how long it's been present. Uh, the conditions for its population growth earlier this year were not ideal as were over the last summer as well. So there's a slight possibility it's been here for several months and it's only just hit the right conditions to actually breed to a, a noticeable level within crops, or it's a very recent introduction and it's just hit the ground running in perfect conditions. Uh, at this point too, although we are looking at tracing backwards to identify where it entered the country, at the moment we still haven't established how it came through. <clears throat> Following the detection of any new pest or disease, New South Wales DPI will launch some form of response effort that is always dependent on the conditions and the pest involved. And so for this particular pest, being an insect pest, uh, we launched uh, an emergency response that was working with local land services as well and was really focused on gathering intelligence on the situation as quickly as we possibly could to understand exactly what we were facing. So that involved quite a bit of surveillance throughout the Sydney Basin because we needed to understand how widespread uh, serpentine leaf miner actually is, and also particularly what host crops were being affected. Um, as Elia will cover later on, serpentine leaf miner does have a very broad host range, uh, so we were concerned that it was in um, both vegetables and ornamentals, but it also potentially can get into weed species. So understanding exactly which host it's preferring in Australia was really important. The reason we need to get that information as quickly as possible is we need to make decisions to manage the biosecurity risk of, risk of a new pest. So if it was contained to one or two properties, that drastically influences the next decisions for the response. If we quickly determine that it's very widespread, then we look at other options to support industry on how best to manage it. Um, in about three weeks of surveillance on the ground, there was over 150 properties surveyed and that surveillance is now spreading out into regional areas to get a good handle of exactly where this pest is in New South Wales. What we know from the response so far is um, we've actually detected serpentine leaf miner now on, as of this morning, it's actually 28 properties. And there's also been detections in Queensland. The regional surveillance work is ongoing as is surveillance within the Sydney Basin. So that number is likely to keep rising as we're getting more diagnostic results through. We're noticing it on a range of different vegetable crops uh, across different host families as well. And the damage seems to be really dependent on the host that we're finding it in as well. We've noticed some pretty severe damage in uh, some of the leafy vegetables and in bean and cucumber in particular as well. We have also found it in ornamentals in petunia and snapdragon. And importantly, it has been detected in several weed species as well. You can't tell the difference between serpentine leaf miner, vegetable leaf miner, or the endemic leaf miners in the field. They all leave the same sort of damage. And as you can see from the images up on the screen, the typical damages are these little um, trails through the leaves that are caused by the larvae actually chewing through the inside of the leaf surface. But if you notice on the bottom right hand image there as well, there's speckled damage there and that's caused from the adult flies feeding or laying eggs within the leaf as well. And that's a common symptom across all the leaf miners. So what we really need to do is get samples into the lab to actually confirm which species it is that we're dealing with. So what does this mean in terms of management for producers? Because we have found it across a broad geographic area across now two states, we've also found it in a large range of host species, and we found it in weed species as well, which represents a large body of vegetation that is more or less uncontrolled vegetation. Um, it's been deemed not technically feasible to eradicate. So what happens is the response that New South Wales DPI is leading at the moment will slowly phase through to a management uh, operation. And to be able to do that properly to support industry, we've been rapidly compiling together as much information as we can uh, to provide 
tailored program information for both ornamental and vegetable growers and diagnostic information so people who want to submit samples have the right tools to be able to do that effectively. It's important that we have a consistent approach for management because this is a very difficult pest to manage. And so the more information that we can provide to producers to cover the whole range of different crop types that are affected is important. What we have available at the moment is already up on the website. There are new documents being compiled as we speak and they will continuously go up on the website as they're developed. We also have um, a link to the chemicals page for anyone who's interested in what chemical options are available. They are limited, but what we have is up on the website and that is also being constantly updated as well. The other thing that was really important to understand about this particular pest is, does it bring with it any form of insecticide resistance? Serpentine leaf miner does have a reputation overseas for developing resistance to different chemicals. As we still don't know where this particular population has come from, we need to understand if it does in fact already have resistance to any chemicals. So our specialist insecticide resistance unit at EMAI is already un, uh, undertaking some investigation in that to, to inform our, our control programs going forward. And if they were to find anything that was concerning, that would certainly be flagged with industry and that information would also go up through our website as it comes through. But it's a very complex process, so it will take a little bit of time to get that information. Our regional surveillance is still ongoing and we're working with other jurisdictions to, to broaden that out basically across the east coast of Australia at this point to, to really get a handle of exactly where this pest is and what crops it is affecting. And if you can see the images that I've got on the, the slide there, this is on a cucumber and the little tiny black fleck that's inside that red circle is the fly itself. They are very small. They are difficult to see in the field. Uh, and that's why they often may be overlooked until we start to see the leaf miner damage actually in the plants themselves. Moving forward, uh, we're keen for industry to keep reporting any suspect sightings of leaf miner damage on their property. We are particularly encouraging people who are beyond the Sydney Basin and people who have damage across a wide range of plant hosts to submit samples for testing. We cannot identify this in the field, um, although the photographs are, are very useful. Um, what we really need is a sample to, to test. So if you have a sticky trap that might have some of the adult flies on it, that's fantastic. There's also options if you have uh, plant samples with either pupae on the leaf or the leaf mining damage, preferably with the larvae inside, um, that one can also be tested as well. There's an option to call the exotic plant pest hotline on 1800 084 881. The reports are coming straight through to us and then we can get in contact with you to understand the issue that you're having more thoroughly. Alternatively, you can also email the biosecurity hotline with that same information. Uh, what I would implore people to do if they are making a report through the hotline or through the website is to please give me a contact number. I can't call you to discuss the issue with you if I have no way of getting in touch with you. Um, I completely understand that some people may wish to remain anonymous. Um, the information isn't disclosed to anyone. It's just so that I can physically get on the phone and call you back and understand what problems you're having. Understanding exactly where we have this pest in regional areas is important moving forward. It may allow us to provide an early warning system to producers if it's moving into new areas. More importantly, it allows us to inform management decisions to be as tailor-made for industry as we can possibly make them. If we don't know that it's impacting on certain crop types, then we can't make sure that a management options are tailored for that particular situation. As I've mentioned again, the most up-to-date details that we have are currently on the DPI website. If you go to the DPI landing page and search exotic leaf miners, that'll bring you to the page where all of the links and all of the fact sheets are constantly being loaded up there. And I believe that that's also where this webinar will be recorded and uploaded in the coming days as well. So for those of you who need to go back and watch it again, or other people are interested in watching it at a later date, that's going to be the best place for it. And that's all for me. So I'll quickly stop that and hand you back to Jonathan. Thanks, Shannon. As I mentioned, um, if we can hold any questions till we have the panel, that would be great. But please write your questions down in the chat so that um, we can ask the uh, the whole present all the panel uh, at the end of the session. Our second presenter is Dr. Elio Pertel. Um, Elio is from from Caesar in Melbourne, as I mentioned before, and she's going to be speaking about the biology of serpentine leaf miner. So over to you, Elio. Thanks. Just 
go ahead and share my screen as well. All right, does everybody see that okay? All right, yes. uh, my name's Aliyah, and I'm gonna go over some of the basic biology of the serpentine leaf miner. But before getting into that, I did also want to reflect on the question of how prepared are we actually for this pest in Australia? And on one hand, we have quite a huge benefit in that Australia is just about the last country to have an incursion of the serpentine leaf miner. This pest is already um, well distributed overseas, which means we have the advantage of learning from all the mistakes and all the successes that have already occurred overseas as far as how to manage this pest. So that is, is huge for us. Um, but even more importantly, um, we've actually been preparing for this pest for the last three years. Port Innovation um, started quite a, a comprehensive um, and well-funded project three years ago, which included the nursery, vegetables, melons, and potato industries, um, acknowledging that serpentine leaf miner, as well as two other um, closely related pests, could pose a great risk to Australia. And we're actually right on the end of that project, which means we're sort of in a, in a um, lucky situation in that we really are ready um, to respond to this pest. And just as a, as a summary of exactly what we've been working on for the last um, three years, oh, and I should point out, um, this project has been really collaborative. It's involved um, myself and, and my colleagues at CSER Australia, University of Melbourne, Plant Health Australia, um, the North Australia Quarantine Strategy, and Ausveg. And we've been looking at surveillance, biocontrol options, chemical options, risk forecasts, um, all, to build, um, all to build a preparedness plan. And while we started focusing on vegetable leaf miner, which Shannon mentioned was present in the Torres Strait and the very north tip of Queensland, we did actually expand our project about halfway through to also focus on serpentine leaf miner, as well as another close relative, American serpentine leaf miner. Um, and I wonder if that was in the way. And you can see that um, serpentine leaf miner incursion has happened only about a month before our final report was um, ready. So we've got quite a lot of information ready to share. So back to some of the biological information. Um, serpentine leaf miner is one of three exotic Liriomyza flies that are all well-known pests overseas. Um, they're known for having really wide host ranges for causing um, quite a lot of damage overseas. And we already had vegetable leaf miner present in Australia since 2015. Um, but under quarantine on the, on the far northern tip of Queensland. Um, while American serpentine leaf miner over here and serpentine leaf miner here, we knew they were both present as close as um, Indonesia. And of course now serpentine leaf miner has been found in Australia. And just to um, emphasize Shannon's point as well, they really are quite tiny and hard to spot. Um, you can see they're all little black and yellow flies. You can't tell the difference between them. Serpentine leaf miner, as well as um, these other exotic leaf miner, all have the um, same life cycle, involves an egg, a larvae, a pupae, and an adult. Um, the female fly lays an egg inside a leaf. When that egg hatches, you get a little yellow maggot that emerges, and it's, um, it spends its time beneath the top and bottom surface of the leaf. You can just see it through the top surface. And its feeding habit involves, it has this black mouthpiece that looks a bit like a pickaxe, and you can, you can see here, um, it just mines away at the inside of the leaf, creating these white spiraling tunnels. Um, and once that larvae is mature, it cuts its way out of the tunnel, crawls to the ground, um, and pupates in the soil before um, the adults later emerge. And it's that larval stage where they're pickaxing away inside the leaf, which causes the most damage. And it causes these white trailing mines um, through the leaf. And these two pictures here, um, are both photos of serpentine leaf miner damage, while these two on the right are caused by vegetable leaf miner, which is that other species um, present up in the far north tip of Queensland. You can also see some of the dots, which Shannon was also referring to here, um, the stippling caused by females poking holes to lay eggs and also to feed on the plant juices. And I also just wanted to um, emphasize that same point that this isn't gonna be the only spiraling white leaf mine damage you'll see in Australia, um, because we actually have a lot of native and naturalized leaf miner flies already present here, and they all make indistinguishable damage. And in fact, of all these photos, only this central square is an exotic leaf miner, 
this is vegetable leaf miner up in the Torres Strait. All the others are um, common, common Australian flies, um, including this one here on South Isle, which is really common around Melbourne, particularly right now, hitting South Isle is really hard. Um, and this one as well, the cabbage leaf miner is really common in brassicas. And in fact, the adult cabbage leaf miner, which is one of our longtime naturalized species, looks identical to the adult of serpentine leaf miner. So this is just to emphasize how important it is to rely on experts for identification, to send in your samples, and to call the exotic plant pest hotline. Um, and we do have um, a guide that our project has developed to just help you with some tips for how to survey and how to um, how to take samples. Um, and we can send that link around in a in an email after this webinar. Now, the, another one of the reasons why serpentine leaf miner is considered such a problematic pest overseas is it just has an incredibly wide host range, which includes most of the vegetables we like to eat and the ornamentals we like to grow. Um, so you can see there's um, a large range of families covered, um, at least 15 families, including onions and garlic, celery, spinach and beetroot, a lot of solanaceous vegetables. Um, they particularly like potatoes, um, but also tomatoes, eggplants, um, melons, a lot of ornamental asters, as well as lettuce, a lot of beans. Um, it's, it's really a wide host range, but again, it's really important that we now have a close look at what the realized preferences are in Australia, because every population can be a little different. And the weed hosts are extremely important as well, because knowing what weed hosts and potentially native Australian plants they're going to start preferring um, is really a key to being able to manage them into the future. So that'll be a big focus um, moving forward from here. Now, a little bit about their um, sort of climate biology. Again, this is a pest that is really well studied overseas. So we're not totally in the dark as far as what sort of climates are most suitable for it. In fact, there's been a lot of laboratory testing where they've um, looked at uh, maximum temperatures, minimum tolerable temperatures. Um, when is the soil too wet? When is the soil too dry? When are plants too wilted? So that information is all really valuable. And, and just as a sort of big picture summary, what we know is that serpentine leaf miner can complete a life cycle anywhere between five and 30 degrees, though above 30, it really gets too hot for them. They're not a very heat adapted pest. They are, however, quite cold adapted. They can survive sub freezing temperatures as a pupa. Um, so they, they are expected to do a bit better um, in cooler regions and in the temperatures where they can grow fastest, life cycles can be quite rapid. They can be between two weeks and a month. And our project has even developed a tool that predicts life cycle length based off of where you are and what time of the year is it. Um, and again, I can make sure that link um, is shared, um, but that's um, quite, a useful, quite a useful tool in understanding how many generations you might expect to see within a growing region in your season. Now, the other thing we can do is once we understand, um, you know, what the sort of bounds are on their growth and development, we also know what climates are available in Australia, and we can add those two together. And to make a quite a long story short, what it lets us do is predict where this pest is going to grow best in Australia. And essentially what the regions you see here in dark purple are regions where we expect serpentine leaf miner could remain active year round. And the regions in red, they might only be able to be active about half the year. Um, all the way down to areas where they can't be active at all. And so this is also really important information um, in understanding what, what sort of risk this pest will um, impose and what sort of management is going to be necessary um, in areas where the pest can be quite active. There's going to be a lot more information about these sorts of local risk forecasts coming out in our final project, um, so do stay tuned. So what does this all mean as far as impact um, to industry? Well, the leaf mining damage is what really drives the impacts. Um, the larvae are literally removing photosynthetic material from the plant, so it can stunt their growth. It can um, cause failure to fruit. It can even kill plants, particularly if they're seedlings. And that stippling damage can also open plants up to secondary infections. And this could lead to reduced yield of the plants. Um, even if the plants themselves aren't um, harmed, um, in their growth ability, it can reduce marketability of leafy greens and ornamentals and pest management can become costly, particularly because these flies have um, a propensity for a lot of insecticide resistance. And you'll hear more about that shortly. And we have seen some pretty dire examples overseas of the impacts these pests can cause. For instance, when, when serpentine leaf miner arrived in Indonesia in the 90s, it was reported to cause 70% yield losses in potatoes. 
So it's now really important to ask, why were those losses so high? What caused that? Is it something we can avoid in Australia? And to answer that question, I want to start here with these two photos of bean plants from South America. Um, these are actually photos of vegetable leaf miner damage rather than serpentine leaf miner damage, but the concept is going to be identical. And one of these two bean plants has been regularly treated with insecticide foliar spray, um, and the other one has not. And the story is a bit more complicated than it might seem because it's actually this really festy looking bean plant on the right, which was receiving regular insecticide treatments. So what is happening here? In a natural system, the serpentine leaf miner, as well as all the other exotic polyphagous leaf miner, are actually really well controlled by their own natural enemies, which are these tiny parasitoid wasps. They're only about a millimeter, and you'll learn a little bit more about their life cycle um, in Dr. Peter Ridland's talk. Um, but for now, you can just think the movie Alien. Um, and if they were large, you would actually be able to see just how beautiful they are, um, but they're really small, so you'd need a microscope to, to appreciate them. But this is one of the species we have in Australia. Now, these little wasps are extremely sensitive to chemicals, and what happens if you get repeated insecticide um, exposure that's inappropriate is you wipe out these wasp communities. And you might, you might knock out some of the flies as well, but the flies are just much more tolerant. They might be resistant to insecticide. The larvae are protected inside the leaf. So what ends up happening is you wipe out the predators and the flies are allowed to grow to much larger numbers, causing much more damage. And this is why they're really classic examples of secondary pests. And this scenario is ubiquitously associated with those large losses we've seen overseas. And this is just incredibly important right here because this is what Australia needs to avoid um, to ensure that we manage this pest correctly from the offset and we don't see those really dramatic impacts. Um, and I'm going to leave it there. Um, up next, um, Rowan Burgess is going to talk more about chemical options, um, particularly in the lens of how to make sure we're being appropriate for our natural wasp communities. Um, but in the meantime, pop any questions you have in the chat. And um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Aaliyah. Um, fascinating uh, information there and great videos, by the way. Uh, as Alia said, our next speaker will be Rowan. Uh, Rowan Burgess is the Surveillance Project Coordinator with Plant Health, Plant Health Australia. And he will be talking about insecticide options for controlling serpentine leaf miner. So over to you, Rowan. All right. Thank you. I'll just share the screen. Come on. There we go. So hopefully it's working, looks like it's working. Um, so thank you for coming along today. My name's Rowan Burgess. Um, and we've, as Elias just said, we've just finished or in the process of finishing off a project uh, funded through Hort Innovation and looking at various components of uh, how you go about managing uh, leaf miner. Uh, the portion of the the project that I was involved in was uh, most of the chemical control side of things. Um, so the project was looking at consolidating information around chemical management options that they use overseas that we could adopt in Australia should leaf miner occur here. And unfortunately it's decided to um, arrive. So the things that we were looking at when we were selecting chemical control options uh, was we were looking at the ability of the pest to evolve, evolve resistance overseas um, to the particular chemical. And we we're also looking at the efficacy of the chemical against the leaf miner, because obviously you want to know that the, um, the chemical is effective. And we we're also looking at how disruptive it was towards the parasitoids that keep leaf miner under control. Because as Ilya said, um, we know from overseas that when you take out beneficial insects, the uh, leaf miner becomes a significant issue. So we sort of use that lens to try and come up with some chemical control options. Um, again, when we're selecting chemicals, we're looking at how the chemical actually works as well. Um, because of the leaf miner's uh, life cycle, it spends a lot of its time inside the leaf. So that means that a contact insecticide isn't going to work to kill the, um, the larvae, but it will help. Uh, knock down the adults, but that's only half the problem. Um, so that means we were looking for more things like systemics and translaminar um, mechanisms to actually penetrate the leaf and get at the, uh, 
the larva. And that also has some advantages for um, IPM as well, which I'll get to in a second. Um, so back to the things we were looking at when we were picking chemical control options. Uh, we looked at how disruptive the chemicals were on the uh, beneficial insects. So when choosing chemicals to manage this pest going forwards, and this is something we'll obviously have to keep in mind now that's here, is we want to be quite selective in trying to pick the chemicals that are less, least disruptive towards the beneficials. Um, so things like we're going to phosphates are fairly hard on them, whereas some of the, the softer chemistry, if you like, um, things like chromazine and uh, chlorine tranoprol and even abamectin and stuff like that is less damaging on the, um, the beneficial. So that's the sort of chemistry that we were focusing on when we were looking for uh, potential um, products to apply for permits and stuff like that for the APVMA. Um, <clears throat> and just to sort of summarise some of the process, this is a diagram I think Elio actually helped put together with the illustrations. Um, basically, we've got here the some of the chemistry used overseas to control the pest, um, and that's used commercially overseas in places like the US and what, Europe and stuff. Um, we then looked at how it affects the different life stages of the organism. Um, so some of them are more effective against eggs and larvae and adults or what have you. We looked at the uh, toxicity towards the beneficials, and then we looked at the use patterns within Australia to see um, which crops we could use it on. Because because of the wide host range and having a, you, we need to be able to sort of control it across a range of different uh, crops potentially. Um, so we're looking at options which we could use across the range of crops just to get um, you know control options up and to also provide different modes of action for um, rotating chemicals and that sort of stuff. Um, so the end result of the project so far has been that we've developed a number of uh, permits that Hort Innovation actually holds um, on our behalf um, and these give us some control options in most of the host crops um, that are severely affected by leaf miners. Um, all of the products on the screen are suitable for uh, Liramiza hewitabrensis or serpentine leaf miner. Um, some of them, there's some caveats around the use, uh, some of the chromazine product, um, take a step back. Some of the crops that chromazine can be used on can will have to be destroyed after use. So they're really for an eradication type situation. Um, now that the organism is established, we'll have to use um, those sorts of things with care. So we will be uh, trying to change some of the permit language and stuff like that going forwards. But at the moment, the existing permit has uh, clauses there saying that if you treat particular crops of um, brassicas and uh, leafy vegetables, uh, you'll have to destroy the crop afterwards. So obviously make sure we read the label before we use it, um, just to keep that sort of stuff in mind. Um, so what else can we say? The range of crops we've got, sorry, the range of chemicals we've got here allow us control options on of a couple of modes of action on most crops now. Um, so that lets us rotate chemicals and that'll help reduce the risk of developing resistance. What we haven't explored yet is we haven't really got any thresholds and things like that developed because it's so new in the country. And that's something that'll have to be developed in the coming years as, the, as we sort of learn about the biology of the pest once it's here, unfortunately. Um, I think overseas they talk about a 5% sort of impact before treatment, but that's very back of the envelope um, stuff. So that, that's the sort of thing we'll have to be a bit careful about so we don't overuse the chemical and be too hard on the beneficials. And it's also just the economic costs of um, applying chemicals. So um, that's the main stuff I wanted to cover. So as a summary, um, we want to preserve the natural control options as much as we can, the beneficial insects. Um, and 
we don't really have an IPM system fully planned out yet um, because of the, we don't quite know how the algorithm is going to behave when it gets here, now that's here. Um, when selecting chemicals, we want to minimise the disruption on the parasitoids as much as possible. Um, the effective insecticides are all systemic and translaminar, and the, the options that we've selected so far are reasonably safe to use for the beneficials. Um, we've got multiple modes of action allowing us to minimise the risk of um, resistance developing. That's not to say there's no risk. Um, we know from overseas that some of the products there, like abamectin, um, can, there, there's the ability for the organism to develop resistance, but at the moment, this is what we've got. Um, and yeah, our, our project so far has developed a number of um, permits covering a range of different um, control options. I should point out, sorry, I'm getting a bit dry, um, should point out that this is a moving feast. New chemicals are coming along fairly regularly at the moment. Um, they're either being modified, uh, existing permits are being modified or uh, new products are being applied for permits. Um, so I'd recommend that you check the New South Wales DPI website out fairly frequently, as well as the APVMA databases, if you're familiar with those, just so you're running off the most up-to-date information. Um, yeah, so thank you. And I think that's all from me. Thanks, Rowan. If you can unshare, that would be great. Many thanks for that. Um, and continuing on, um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Peter Ridland. Um, Peter is the Honorary Research Fellow from the University of Melbourne. He's also been involved in this project that's involved uh, Rowan and Aaliyah. And um, he's going to be talking about the in integrated pest management of serpentine leaf miner. So over to you, Peter. Thanks, Jonathan. Good morning, everyone. Lyria Miser Huita Brensis, IPM Strategies. It's a, an area close to my heart. I've been worrying about this pest since 1997, would you believe? I thought it'd just be worth tracking back on some of the recent history. The, the pest is a native to South America. And basically for many years, it was a non-issue. A non, non it really started to flare up in Peru where growers were spraying a lot of insecticide, trying to control a, a leaf, a leaf, a lepidopteran leaf miner called Tuta absoluta, which is ironically spreading around the world very dramatically as well. So they weren't targeting Lyria miser, but in the, in, the con in the circumstances, they actually developed resistance to these organophosphates in the main and also the parasitoids were killed and they led to an amazing problem in, in potatoes, which continues to this day. It's also in Argentina and it's pretty widespread. In Colombia, it was sort of moved into Colombia and that in Colombia, they were growing a lot of uh, chrysanthemum cuttings where they were sort of bulking up for Europe. And, uh, and unfortunately, that was probably the way it started to move. It was first found in Europe in about 1989. And growers there found that they already had, already had other lyrimizers there, but it was even more difficult to control with insecticides than the ones they had. And it's now currently well established, certainly in the Mediterranean countries. Moved to Africa in 1990. It's currently a major problem in Kenya, where they've had a major biocontrol push, but it's uh, it's about 95% of the leaf miners they find on their small holding crops at a whole range of altitudes is Lyria miser huidabrensis, serpentine leaf miner. And there was a major movement through Asia in the early 90s. It was first found in China in 93, and it moved through Southeast Asia at the same sort of time. Indonesia was 1994. Places like China and Indonesia, 25 years on, the pest is not nearly as a problem as it was. But my experiences in Indonesia, where I had an ACR project, I was involved there for 2001 to 2004, it was this universal theme. And please, you're probably getting sick of us beating this drum, but we're going to keep beating this drum. 
that the destruction of parasitoid wasps by excessive use of non-selective insecticides and the development of insecticide resistance in the flies is critical to avoid. And the message is that effective management can be developed. In Indonesia, growers were spraying three times a week. I think they were wasting a lot of money. They were, they were using the cheapest insecticides. Of course, when you spray a, a leaf mined, mined potato, the leaf mines even don't go away. So they, they were looking worse and worse. So we, there was a lot of IPM training going on. There's a strange looking fellow at the back there who was admiring this farmer field school that I was involved in. But that was a great introduction to the extent of the parasitoids and the, the value of them. So moving to, a, to Sydney in particular, we're, and in Australia, we're at year zero and there are many unknowns. And there's a whole lot of unanswered questions which will be answered in the next few years. But at the moment, we have educated guesses. Until we go through two or three seasons, we really won't understand the pest, how it responds to the Australian environment, which is such a varied environment. Things like the seasonal abundance of phenology. When will the pest really be, be important? Are our natural enemies responding? And what are the yield losses on different crops? We know that different crops will respond differently. Some crops can survive a lot more leaf miners than others. For example, if you're growing celery, if you're actually mining the mining the, the, the PDLs, which you're going to be uh, selling, that's obviously fairly different from having a pumpkin or a cucumber where you can withstand some loss of, of, of leaf. The, the non-crop hosts, as Aaliyah mentioned, are very important. Already there's been, we heard from Shannon that several weeds have been identified as being heavily mined. We don't know yet about the dispersal between properties and even within properties. And as Rowan mentioned, the sampling and economic thresholds have to be developed for Australian conditions. And this is work that will have to, will evolve in the next few years as we all of us get to know how the pest is working. Rowan also talked about the emergency use permits, which is fantastic that, that more and more are coming on. But these are temporary and it's important that chemical companies move towards getting registrations for appropriate insecticides so that we're not in this emergency use permit situation. In the insecticide resistance status, I was delighted to hear that the DPI New South Wales is already hard at work. It's very lucky because DPI New South Wales is one of the leading resistance, insecticide resistance labs in, in the country. And so while we know we have organophosphate synthetic pyrethroid and carbamate resistances, and it's very likely that these resistance will, will have come in with these pests. Even more important, I think, is getting baseline data for the new insecticides that we are promoting for through the permits so that we've actually got baseline data so we can actually, going forward, we can be monitoring changes in susceptibility. So that's always very important for resistance management. But there are successful IPM approaches overseas. And I was just going to outline the, the sort of the key concepts, really. It's very important to reduce the initial leaf miner pressure. And so that's having clean transplants. It's important to deep plough previously infested crops so that the, the pupae that go into the soil are buried quite deeply and makes it very difficult for the flies to emerge through a, a lot of soil. Ideally, you're trying to avoid planting new crops adjacent to old crops. I appreciate that that really depends on how your sequential planting systems work. It's possible in some areas, not in others. And again, I'm just going back to the messages that have been mentioned before about the feeding punctures of the female Lyria miser, which can be very distinctive, very small ones. The female adults puncture the leaves with the ovipositor. And the females and males feed on exuding sap. And that's actually a very important time for the females because in fact the host plant volatiles will attract the, the, the males and so mating can occur. So that's that's quite an important issue. They will lay eggs there, but the number of feeding punctures is much, much greater than the number of eggs laid. So it does enable you to sort of get this early warning sign. And I think that's a very important thing you want to see. If you start to see a lot of these early punctures in your seedlings or your young plants, that's a sign that's happening that the miners will start soon. So to conserve parasitoid wasps, it's important not to be spraying at the first sign of a 
of a leaf mine. You need time for them to move into the crop and to, to develop. So I think if, you, if we, once we develop the decent economic thresholds, we can actually reduce the number of the sprays without reducing yield. And that also enables the parasitoids to move in and complement the chemical treatments. So it's always important to check the seedings for the feeding stipples and the new mines. And consultants will be able to check the older leaves with a hand lens and you can see the live larvae. The larvae, as Ali had, had on, the, on her video, sort of yellow green and quite active. And hopefully you'll see other dead larvae and parasitized larvae, which are darker. And that gives you a good, a good feeling as to whether you've actually got parasitism happening. Again, you can hear the sound of the drum as I beat it. Avoid broad spectrum insecticides. You do not use target leaf miner flies with inappropriate chemicals. I shudder at the thought of the Indonesian farmers with the best intent spraying three times a week with whatever they could find. And it was always the, usually organochlorines or organophosphates. So as Rowan mentioned, the systemic and translaminar insecticides with, the, with adjuvants are really important. The rotation of the chemical groups, we now have enough permits to do that. But also you need to consider the effect of insecticides that, that are used for other pests. So it's gonna be, if you're spraying a, a broad spectrum against say thrips or something like that, that has just the same effect on the leaf miners. So, so in terms of managing the pests of your crop, you need to look at the, the pest, the insecticide management as a totality so that you, so that the, that enables that all, all of the pests you've got won't be, will be able to rotate chemical groups and not interfere with each other. We keep talking about biological controls and parasitoids. Before I keep going, I'd like to acknowledge the fantastic work that Leah has done with her photographs and her illustrations she's done. It's really quite, it's, it's impressive. But we, there's a lot of endemic parasitoid species and they can, they can attack our invading gliriomyces. And so the non-crop hosts play a really important role of reservoirs. So these parasitoids can move from there into the crop. There's a wide range of shapes and size, or all pretty small, about a millimetre long, but a lot of colours, some amazing internal structures, wonderful metallic colours. It really is a life going on that we have, that we just don't see as human beings. It's, a, it's this microscopic life that's working hard for us. And so the parasitoid wasps work in two ways. They, they'll kill some of the larvae just by host feeding, and they'll also do the parasite web where they lay their eggs and the wasp, wasp um, kills that larvae that way. The all important message is that these wasps are generalists. They don't just attack one leaf minor species. And so that enables us to have these non-crop leaf miners acting as reservoirs for parasitoids, which, which can then move into the crop. It makes sense if you're a very small wasp, you don't want to be stuck with one one host species that you've got to find. Once you emerge from a plant, you want to be able to, you, your task is to sort of find a leaf mine to, to attack and lay an egg. So there's two sort of major sort of life history strategies, which I think are important to understand when you're thinking about how your parasitoids are attacking your leaf miners. Now, very similar, they have the same life stages as, as a leaf miner with the egg larva, pupae and adult. The first group, well, I've, dubbed here paralyze and host feed. So these wasps, they encounter the leaf mines, they detect there's a leaf mine, a larvae there, and they sting it and paralyze it immediately with their toxin or their venom. And the advantage of that is that it fixes the side of the food resource for their offspring. In other words, they'll probably paralyze a large larva to, to lay an egg into, and the smaller ones, they'll either have, they'll host feed, they might be smaller, larvae, they'll sting, and there'll be exudates coming from that larva and they, they need to feed on the, on the proteins and the lipids coming from those that stung larva to enable them to develop eggs because they don't have very many eggs when they hatch or the wasp doesn't have very many eggs when it first emerges. So once, once, the, uh, once they've paralyzed the host, leaf mining stops basically. So this is why it's obviously a good thing. The second group, is, is what I call the no paralysis, no host feeding group. 
and they don't paralyze the host immediately, but they can lay their egg at any stage of the larvae. So often they might even lay an egg in a very small, a small stage larva, but the fly is apparently unharmed. And so it keeps mining the leaf. And it's only after the fly pupates that the parasitoid starts to develop and then emerges from the, the pupae of the, of the fly. And the advantage for, for, the, for the wasp is that by doing it this way, it guarantees that it has a, a maximum size food resource for its, for its offspring because it knows it's, it's going to be, have the entire pupa to develop. And it's always important to remember that the wasps are doing this fantastic job, but they're not doing the fantastic job because they want to help us. They're doing this fantastic job because they're looking to survive. So we have to learn to manage the, the wasp. We can't just sort of expect them to do it just out of the goodness of their heart. There's a couple of things with this examples of, so we've got this magnificent Zagramosoma wasp, which is found from the tip of Cape York right down to Melbourne. Very handsome indeed. Typical thing of a parasite larva there. And where, if you're actually looking at leaves with a magnifying glass, you'll see you'll often see these sort of structures here, and that's the a parasitoid, parasitoid pupa, and these three or four pillars on each side of the pupa are what we call meconial pillars. And just before they start to pupate, they exude these these columns of meconial material, and basically it seems to be protecting, it, it helps to expand the, the leaf mine around the, the pupa so it doesn't get squashed so much. And there's a number of number of the parasitoids have that. So that's quite a distinctive way of seeing it with a lens. It, it shows up very clearly. So that's a, a very good guide to see whether in fact the parasitism is happening. As I mentioned, we've got a large number of parasitoids attacking Lyrimizer in Australia. We've got at least 50 species we know of, which might well attack SLM and probably there's a lot more. Some of the key ones are Hemitarsinus varicornis, this very handsome fellow here with his branched antlers on the antennae. The Glyphus Isaiah, which is an, a, a pest that came into Australia by itself uh, from overseas. <coughs> Excuse me. It's very, use, it's very important for mass rearing and use in glass houses in Europe and in North America and China. We have two graduate students that have been working very hard on parasitoids and leaf miners, and they've found, confirmed conclusively that we have Neochrysocorus formosa, which is a very important parasitoid, much like the Glyphus, which is um, certainly found around Melbourne. And uh, that work will be published very soon. And also we have several species of opiates, which are a larger braconid wasp, and they a wasp which, uh, have the no paralysis, no host feeding mechanism, but they vary because the advantage for the wasp is that they emerge from a pupae. And so some of the pupae that aren't parasitized, will, the flies will emerge, so they, and they have much greater synchronization of the, uh, between host and, uh, and wasp. And also inside the pupae is a very good place to, to over summer. So the long, the message is we've got abundant reservoirs of parasitoids in Australia. Many common weeds such as south thistle, south thistle plantain, brassicaceous weeds and volunteer grasses. We always need to do more research and we're going to look, know a lot more as serpentine leaf miner starts to, to spread. Start to spread and also the parasitoids get to know that it's turned up. So the message is we don't need to import any more exotic parasitoid species at this stage. We have, have a wide range. What we have to do is to learn to look after them. And we do have suitable species available for mass rearing if needed for glasshouse production. Finally, we do have a whole lot of resources from the, the Hort Innovation Project. There's an OzVeg link here. You can also just Google OzVeg and Leaf Miner and you'll certainly come up with that uh, project portal. And I strongly advise you to do that. And I'll leave it there. and. The next speaker will be Lloyd Kingham, who's looking at regular re regulatory information. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. I, I'm really heartened to hear some of the positive news you were telling us this morning. Um, it's not often we hear that about uh, a new pest that's arrived in Australia, so that's great. Um, 
Our next speaker is Lloyd Kingham. Um, obviously, one of the consequences we have when we get a new pest into Australia that it initiates market access issues, and uh, and Lloyd is going to be outlining the regulatory requirements um, which could impact on the movement of plants and produce from the affected areas today. So Lloyd is the Plant Biosecurity Officer from New South Wales DPI, and I'll hand over to you, Lloyd. Thank you. Thank you very much. And congratulations to the researchers and the projects and their outputs to date. The, the risk assessments you put in place and the control options that you're giving us guidance on enables us to move quickly to regulate in, a, in an environment which we're operating in now. So um, uh, thank you once again. The, um, the, the, the process that we've undertaken in New South Wales is since um, uh, we responded to the outbreak, we had individual biosecurity directions on infested premises. In the last week, we moved to a control order, which um, was across all producers in New South Wales who had um, serpentine leaf miner host plants with leaf miner signs. But today we're operating under a general biosecurity duty for all people to be using the most appropriate mechanisms to, to control serpentine leaf miner now that we know it's established in New South Wales. So I, I guess the thing that I want to start with is that, um, hello, I've got, a, um, I've got a hang on my system here is that yes, there were restrictions in place, but as of today, the restrictions are for persons generally in New South Wales meeting their general biosecurity duty. Let's see if this one works. So the general biosecurity for serpentine leaf miner in New South Wales it, it, the, the powers are under part three of the Biosecurity Act. But like I said, if you're dealing with serpentine leaf miner host plants and they've got visible signs of leaf miner damage, and particularly if you're in the Sydney Basin in our high risk trace forward areas, you must act to discharge a general biosecurity duty. Now, importantly, what that means is that you have a number of options at your disposal to try and limit the impact on other growers in New South Wales and potentially nationally. But the most important thing to reinforce what Peter said is we, we don't want people moving, selling or purchasing host plants with visible signs of leaf miner damage. Um, the next most important option is that you monitor for the presence of the pest. And um, once again, need to reassert that we're really interested in seeing sample submissions from growers across New South Wales, but also nationally to your own jurisdictions to just determine what the real extent of this pest is at the moment, because you can't eyeball it. You have to get the samples in. So we invite those sample submissions. Um, we will recognise people using integrated pest management to minimise the impact of serpentine leaf miner in your production systems. Um, and that's to recognise government in the past has been just as guilty as industry of just saying spray it with this magic thing and then you can move it. We're really keen to see that we're, the, the regulatory function is responding to the technical advice and that is if you've got signs of it but you can prove that you're managing it, we're not going to ping you because we, we, we want to see an integrated pest management approach to this, um, to this pest. And you can do that by adhering to industry standards such as a nursery industry accreditation scheme or NIASA. Um, for those who do have um, uh, products coming from serpentine leaf miner host plants, there are approved insecticides like you've seen, but also fumigation and irradiation, which are those post-harvest treatments that uh, we'll recognise for, for, for covering the risk of spreading serpentine leaf miner. And, uh, and I guess some of those cultural things, which we're looking forward to seeing further outputs from the research, um, such as recycling your green waste or you use um, potting media through composting or pasteurisation, and uh, even going so far as the cleaning use equipment so it's free of soil and plant material before it leaves your property. These are all mechanisms you can use now to meet your general biosecurity duty in New South Wales. Um, the interesting thing to note is that today, um, Western Australia entry conditions are active. They are interim import requirements. 
Um, but we're also anticipating that other jurisdictions, once they clarify the trace forwards from New South Wales, will be implementing similar import requirements. Um, what I'd urge you to do, if you anticipate that you have any um, impediments for your commodity for market access domestically, is to drop us a line today to leafminerinfo at dpinsw.gov.au. That'll give people like myself the time to work out if we've got a fix for your particular commodity class. Um, but an, an indication of how we think we're going to be able to cope with some of the movement restrictions interstate or domestically in Australia. Um, I'll go through the example of Western Australia interim conditions that apply today. So the things that they are regulating include nursery stock, green leafy or legume vegetables, particularly legume pods like beans and snow peas, fresh herbs, fruit with leaves or attached green material that may carry the host, or carry the, the serpentine leaf miner, cut flowers and foliage, um, and the, the host list for all of those host carriers or all of those carriers, I should say, is on the New South Wales DPI Serpentine Leaf Miner website where that full host list is. They're also regulating from today machinery and equipment used in association with soil or host plant material. The good news is they've already put in place a number of exclusions based on the research and the contingency plan um, drafts that we've seen to date. So they're not regulating things like grain, seed, dried herbs and plant material, such as hay. Um, below ground vegetables such as potatoes, um, vegetative structures free from leaves, I don't know what that means, um, but fruit free from leaves, so things like oranges for example, even though they're not a host, um, processed host material, things that have gone through some sort of manufacturing process and the whole tissue culture trade which is usually done under quite secure conditions. So a number of exclusions do apply, they don't just say you've got a host plant, Therefore, it's regulated, it's prohibited to move into Western Australia. And that's an early win, once again, that recognises the work that's already done and um, been put in by these projects. So into Western Australia, each consignment must be accompanied by a plant health certificate or a plant health assurance certificate, certifying that the product has been, and there are five different classes. The first one is treated by methyl bromide fumigation for two hours. Um, so in New South Wales, there are at least three accredited facilities that use methyl bromide, and they're used to these treatments because they're already treating fruit fly host material for movement to Western Australia and to other jurisdictions. So that's your magic wand approach. If you've got host produce that you think is showing signs of a serpentine leaf mona, you can get it fumigated. There is some more research coming on other fumigants, but methyl bromide is the only one that's accepted currently by regulators. You may treat that host produce uh, by irradiation at 400 gray. However, as a food product, it needs to be accepted by Fizans, and I'm not sure that Fizans actually covers all fruit and vegetables of our host plants currently. Um, the list is growing all the time, um, but don't just think you can send your host produce to Brisbane and, and get it zapped and sent to WA. We need to check it against that Fizan's code. And the, the other thing is that there are no treatment facilities currently in New South Wales that can handle those sorts of volumes interstate. Um, the Western Australian regulators have made room for recognising integrated pest management. So the, the way they're put into their order or their interim order is treated by an insecticide regime, recognising it's not one chemical, it's a it's a, it's a program of chemicals based on monitoring. So that insecticide regime that's approved by the Western Australian Chief Plant Biosecurity Officer, effective against all stages of serpentine leaf miner. So that pupae in the pots thing is a bit of a concern. And the host produce has to be inspected at the rate of 600 units. So that means in a consignment, you've got to look at every one up to the number of 600 pots and found free of leaf miner and pack and transport under secure conditions to stop it getting stung on route. The point that uh, the researchers earlier made though is that this systems approach procedure, it doesn't yet exist. We, we can't stitch that together just yet. So I can't see too many people wanting to trade uh, Western Australia on that at the moment. 
The fourth option is, particularly for nursery producers, there already is a condition to trade to Western Australia. It's condition 71. Um, you can find that condition online by doing a search on Western Australian agricultural imports. Um, but they already accept biosecure HACCP under the NIASA scheme, I believe, and also New South Wales Department of Primary Industries Interstate Certification Assurance Arrangement number 29. And there are already 25 businesses accredited under that arrangement in New South Wales. So we expect that a lot of our nursery products and seedling trays, if the case may be, going to Western Australia already have that pathway and it will be quite popular. Um, uh, so we, if you want to submit an application for ICA 29, um, visit that plant market access uh, page on New South Wales DPI. Or, or contact your industry to see if they've got an alternative accepted certification scheme to get to WA. The final point is on used machinery and equipment to meet the Western Australian import requirement. When you actually go and have a look at what the requirement says, it, it says free of soil and plant, animal and other, what does it say, organic material? My picture's covering it. Um, both internally and externally. So that's the old free of soil and plant material. Um, now we anticipate that the majority of the people will just ring our biosecurity hotline or email biosecurity at DPI and just book one of our regulatory inspectors to drive out, inspect the machine and issue a plan health certificate to get into Western Australia in the in the near future. Um, if you want to clarify those import conditions, I've put the contact details there. But once again, I urge you, if you if you anticipate that your your commodity class is going to be impeded by these interim movement conditions, Drop us a line today, give us a good early look at what the issue is so we can start negotiating those changes to that interim condition today. Um, so that's just a wrap up of a quick uh, overview of the legislative basis for what we're doing now with Serpentine Leaf Miner, both in New South Wales and Australia wide. I urge you to just do a search on the New South Wales DPI Serpentine Leaf Miner to find the fact sheets um, uh, all of our basic fact sheets are there, including those translated into several languages for the Sydney Basin. There's specific advice on what the host list is, what your available chemicals are that we're keeping up to date, thanks to Janine Kidston's great team. Um, there's also some overarching advice about Serpentine Leaf Miner management. And for Shannon, there's also a big page uh, on how to report and get diagnosed serpentine leaf miner. Uh, and of course, a bit of an overview on this talk as well about how to discharge your general biosecurity duty for serpentine leaf miner. There are further um, information links there as well, but I guess, um, Jonathan, that's the end of my section. So back to you. Thank you, Lloyd. Um, yes, I, I uh, certainly, concur with you that the DPI SLM website is the place to go. It's constantly being updated. Um, if you, I've got a few questions actually, um, which the first one is actually probably for Shannon. Um, the question being is, while we know that um, the mines are probably one of the common symptoms, what you had a picture there of the egg laying damage um, is that a is that a common symptom, or is that something you could recognise? It can be a common symptom, but certainly from what we've seen on surveys in the field, it doesn't appear on every single plant. Um, you can get leaves with mines that don't have very obvious stippling damage, and likewise, you can get leaves with very obvious stippling damage and no mines. Those little pinprick symptoms they are not only caused by egg laying, but also by feeding on the leaf. And uh, there seems to be a, a difference between different hosts as to how many um, times they will pierce the leaf versus how many times they will lay eggs. There is a difference between different hosts as to the rate of egg laying for that one as well. Uh, but it, it, is, it is visible. It can sometimes be concerned with other leaf damaging insect symptoms as well. There's a lot of leaf hoppers out in the field at the moment, thanks to all of the recent rains. Uh, some of the damage caused by other chewing or sap sucking insects 
could be confused. But if you're starting to see that in conjunction with the leaf mines, that's when we trigger a little bit more concern that it might be in fact leaf miner and not something else. Okay, good. And another question probably for you, Shannon, is uh, are there any trapping methods available for SLM and what time of the year is SLM most likely to be a problem? Yeah, the yellow sticky traps are, are really quite good for trapping them. Uh, if you are seeing symptoms within your crop, even if it's at a very low level, we are getting good detection rates uh, off the traps themselves. Uh, there is a fact sheet. If it hasn't gone up on the website yet, it will be up there shortly with a little bit more information about how to set the trap and collect it to send to the lab so that we actually get the samples in good condition. That's probably the easiest way that you can submit samples, but also monitor for damage. The flies are very tiny. So when you see them on a sticky trap, uh, they're not the most obvious thing. They're not like a, a large blowfly flying around. They're, they're very small but they're the ones that the lab really likes to get. So the sticky traps are the best option. You can submit leaf samples, but that is a little bit more difficult. And certainly with trying to get things through a courier or express post at the moment being several weeks off Christmas, uh, that is a little bit more problematic than usual. If you've got a sticky trap that you can leave out for a couple of days and send through, that would be by far the best way to get a sample into us. Okay. Um, next question, probably for... Elia, um, while the climate of inland Southeast Australia may be too hot over summer for SLM, um, will a microclimate within an irrigated crop still allow it to survive and cause damage uh, as we move into the cooler months? Um, yep, I'm ha happy to answer that. And while I'm at it, there was also um, a question um, there was also a question from Chris a little bit earlier up, which I can answer at the same time, which was asking um, how the map I showed um, of activity predictions for this fly, um, what that means in terms of the potential for economic issue, since we've seen um, it seems to be more of an issue in tropical climates. And is this due to shorter generation times in warmer climates? And should we include that in our modeling? Um, so I'll, I'll try and tackle it together. And I actually had a couple slides. I was live together um, when I saw those questions. So if you don't mind, I'll just share my screen once more. Sure. Um, all right, um, is that visible again? Yes. Okay, so I guess to sort of answer answer all these questions at once, including sort of what, we, what seasonality we expect, um, I did, I did sort of whip through this a bit fast in our talk, but um, in my talk before, but we have sort of approached this in quite a like uh, methodological way in that we, we've, we've made predictions of how this pest might behave in Australia using what we know about Australian climate um, is sort of an input. What we know about how this pest grows at different temperatures, that's based on laboratory data collected overseas. Um, you know, so, you know, literally we get plots looking like this, we can take data from that's input data. And as I sort of did touch on in my talk, we, we sort of add that, you know, how well it grows at different temperatures, plus how much different extremes kill it. Um, and all of that creates the prediction that I did show you. Um, but there's a lot more that we can actually look at through this framework. Um, and so for instance, we can actually look at how these predictions look across the globe. And so to answer that question about Indonesia, we can actually compare how growth rates differ in Indonesia versus how growth rate predictions differ in Australia. And this is a really good example, which, which does um, get at what you were asking Chris about why, um, whether the pest does a lot better in those tropical areas and what that's driven by. And you can see by the darker color that we do predict growth rates to be a lot higher in Indonesia um, just based on the fact that um, I had a quick Google of maximum summer temperature um, and, you know, it's, it was giving me 33 degrees on Google, but it's really that there's, there's not so much the dry extreme temperatures um, that the pest would experience here. And even within those regions, they do tend to be considered a high elevation pest in the more montane regions. And so they do get more, um, they can have higher growth rates, more generations per growing season. Um, and according you know, to our predictions, you would expect them to do a lot better in Indonesia than in Australia. Um, but just within Australia itself, that's where we see that it's the cooler parts of Australia that don't experience those hot and dry summers where serpentine leaf miners expected to do best. And we can even look at what 
are the most important stressors in different regions. And this starts to get at Bill's question about irrigation. And for this pest, when we, when we run that model that takes growth rates at different temperatures and mortality uh, of different causes, we can pick out for different regions what is the main driver of mortality. And it's almost ubiquitously across Australia, it's heat stress that is the big killer for this pest and desiccation stress. Um, and, and you can see there's almost no parts of the country that actually get too cold. There's a little bit here in Tasmania. And the way that this, you know, the way you kind of interpret these results is this doesn't take into account human manipulation of environments to make environments more suitable for plant growing. And pretty much anything we do to make an environment more suitable for growing plants also makes it more suitable for pests. And so that means irrigation absolutely is a big, um, will be a big factor in making areas more suitable than they would appear based off of these kind of predictions. Um, for this pest, um, if, if, if you're talking about one of these other Lyrimizes, such as vegetable leaf miner that don't like the cold, for instance, then glass houses are really important. But for Huitabrensis, because they're better in the cold, they don't like the heat, um, irrigation would be, I, I think, one of the bigger concerns as far as human modification of climates. And then just to touch on what this means for seasonality, because what I showed you was sort of across the whole year, how many months of activity, then we really want to know, does that line up with growth seasons? Because you want to know if they're peaking activity when your um, plant production is peaking as well. Um, and we can actually look at it that way. And just as an example, um, you know, we, we can pick a certain location and we can actually tr make predictions for growth rate across the year. Um, and so, for instance, here's some predictions we did for New South Wales. Um, we did Western Sydney after the incursion. And you can see um, in these in these summer months, um, we're not predicting activity is going to be possible. Um, however, moving into the winter, um, they can they can be active. These green areas are when they're peak active. That's when they can be um, up to 100 percent of their maximum growth rate prediction. Um, and this also fits quite well with with what Sharon mentioned at the start of the talk, which is that we do suspect that, you know, these last couple of months around the Western Sydney area have been um, peak growth potential, which is probably why we're seeing, you know, them flare up now. Um, but I guess, you know, fingers crossed, we are moving now back into the summer where temperatures should get um, quite unsuitable again. But again, that's where irrigation can also be important. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. I think that mostly covers um, the three, the three questions. Thanks, Elliot. Yes, um, last weekend um, we had over 40 degrees in Western Sydney, so hopefully that will have some impact on the population. Um, a question from Joanna um, is about melons uh, going into Western Australia. Um, can we, do we assume um, that melon fruit would not be an SLM carrier? Who would like to answer that one? Well, I guess that one's probably best suited home to me. Yes. At, at the moment, um, melon fruit without any leaves attached wouldn't be regulated. Um, but you need to contact the Department of Agriculture in Western Australia just to get that confirmed and to talk to your supply chains, once again, just to get that confirmed. If you do bring them and they say, no, we're going to um, regulate melons as well, then let us know. Send us an email straight away to that leaf miner in, info email address and we'll task that up for negotiation. Thanks, Lloyd. Um, and I'm very conscious of time, but I've got a, I've got a note here from Andy Ryland, which is very pertinent about um, managing waste and crop residues and making sure that uh, it's handled appropriately uh, and not just thrown out uh, because you'll get definitely get reinfestation of SLM. Um, very good point there, Andy. And that's particularly pertinent to uh, greenhouse production as well, which quite often you'll see old plant, plants from the previous crop just lying outside the greenhouse, uh, not the best management. Okay, um, I think... Uh, I think that's about all the slides. Um, I can see any other questions, Leone, that you've got? 
No, you've, you've answered them all. And Ellie has kindly gone in and answered John's question about the term not active. So we've covered yep. them all. Thank you. Okay. All right, everyone. Uh, I wish um, I would like you to join me in thanking our five speakers, um, Shannon, Elia, Rowan, Peter, and Lloyd this morning. Um, heaps of information. Um, as Lloyd mentioned, there is go to the Serpentine Leaf Miner page on the DPI website. And the other number to remember is, if you can see this without me losing, is the Exotic Pest Hotline, 1800-084-881, if you suspect anything uh, that may be of concern to you. So I thank everybody for your participation. I thank the speakers again. Uh, excellent presentations. Uh, it will be available. Um, on the DPI website, and the link will also be shared with today's attendees. So I wish you goodbye, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you very much.